really happy that you're here. We are uh, really excited about our guest um, that I'm going to have the students introduce to you. And um, just let you know, we still have all the activities out there going on. Um, so please still go, feel free to go back out there. If you haven't gotten your t-shirt yet, we have different versions of the, of the t-shirt this year that are really great. Uh, we have some stickers, and then there's, if you haven't gotten a button, there should be, do any students have uh, buttons? Did you guys bring the buttons back over? Does everyone have buttons? If you don't have buttons, we've got buttons right outside, so make sure you leave with your button. Um, what does the, what's on the button? The button has a pigeon with a lightsaber, <laughs> because our guest is a light Star Wars, but she also studies animals in rural and in, uh, urban. urban environments, and so pigeons are one of those. So anyway, that's why we did that. Um, I'm going to now turn the time over, though. I'm, I'm Keith Ogden. I'm the direct uh, the department chair of biology and an evolutionary biologist here. And I've been part of the Darwin Organizing Committee for a long time. I just want to thank everyone who has helped. Uh, Carl and Jess, my two co-collaborators, uh, as far as faculty go, and then the students, and they're going to kind of introduce themselves, I think some of them at least, but the students have been doing a lot, the evolution and bioinformatics stuff, give a hand to the evolution and bioinformatics stuff, they an awesome job this year. So, uh, first we're going to have Avery, let's see, who's doing the gifts? You guys. <laughs> let's, let's do gifts first, and then we'll have Avery present the speakers, that sound good? So, Bass, Morgan, you want to... Okay, so we handmade shirts this year. So, I um, mean, you've already seen it, but we have a shirt made for you. So excited. And it has a rascal. <laughs> and then this is also a gift from oh, the Science Department. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you so much. Hi, I'm Avery Larson. Um, Kath and I are former presidents um, of the Evolution Bioinformatics Club. Uh, we're all very excited to come together as students and um, invite Dr. Carlin to speak to us. Um, this is from her website. Uh, a brief introduct introduction is um, she's a uh, Dr. Carlin is a postdoctoral fellow at Washington University in St. Louis, um, working with Johnson Moses and the National Science Foundation. Um, and for one thing, uh, so she received a PhD in biological subsistence. Sciences from Fordham University in New York City, where she worked at the Munchie South Lab. Her PhD work was on urbanization, on how urbanization affects the evolution of feral pigeons in the northeastern mega city area. Um, she was featured on Saturday Night Live and led to New York Times to refer to her as the pigeon stalker. In addition to her dissertation research, she's a co founder and editor of the Urban Evolution blog. Life in the City, Evolution in the Urbanizing World. Okay, this is Dr. Carlin. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and joining me uh, to celebrate Darwin's birthday. This is really exciting. Um, for me personally, I watched my advisor give one of these Darwin Day talks uh, when I was a graduate student, so it's really nice to be one. Uh, invited. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research um, on evolution and how it's impacted by urbanization. Uh, if you get bored, you can always look for the Star Wars references. They're not on every slide, but they are there. Um, I'm a big Star Wars fan. My dog is named after a Star Wars character. He's at the very end. Uh, so yeah, if you get bored, there you go. Just try to look for the Star Wars reference. So for um, as you know, like, Urbanization is drastically increasing around the globe. And for a long time, these urban spaces were thought of as unnatural or an interesting to study. But these landscapes are really full of wildlife, which actively, which survive, and then some of which actively thrive in these urban areas. And studying these wildlife can tell us a lot about the evolutionary dynamics of the eco-evolutionary dynamics of the world, um, because cities are these ecosystems. Of course, anthropogenic features vary from city to city. Like Sao Paulo is different from Kampala, is different from Sydney, is different from New York, and Moscow, and Mumbai. Partly because each city was built on this pre-existing ecosystem, and partly because things like culture and politics and religion shape the landscape. So I'm gonna give you an analogy here. Cities are kind of like McDonald's, right? There are some general similarities. You can walk into a McDonald's everywhere in the world 
and you can know that it's a McDonald's. It's going to have some general things that are that are very identifiable, but they're also customized to each local culture, right? So in Argentina, you can actually get your little bottle of wine. Um, in Guam, spam is a very big thing. My student was telling me about this, and so you can get spam at McDonald's. Um, in Japan, it's going to be slightly different flavors, and all of that is because it's the city itself is customized in part by the culture and the history. Um, and we need to take this into consideration when studying these cities. So if cities are shaped by their own culture and politics and religious, um, we really, really need to think about those when incorporating uh, these, when thinking as our, about our system as a whole. So I'm going to kind of give you some background on some urban evolution studies that have been conducted in part by some of my best friends. So Dr. Lindsay Miles showed that urban areas act as a hub of genetic connectivity for black widow spiders in the southwestern United States. Meaning that black widow spiders in cities in the southwest are more closely related to each other in the cities than they are to the nearby rural area. And this is because Black widow spiders are building their webs on cars, and our cars are traveling back and forth between the cities and uh, not traveling as frequently to those rural areas. So we're transporting them. So culturally in the US, people are more likely to move between urban areas than they are to move between the urban and the rural. And we really use cars to move. Cars are a big part of American culture. Uh, so yeah, that, I really, really like Lindsay's study on, on black widow spiders. Not such a fan of them when they're not in miles. Um, in, in San Francisco, the Bay Area, urban white crown sparrows in the Bay Area shifted their songs in response to reduced traffic during the COVID-19 shutdown, right? So that was a cultural phenomenon that happened where all of a sudden our, our patterns were changing and, um, these behavioral changes that occur are really important to study because uh, they're often the first signs of adaptation. And so I'll talk about a little bit of my work on some behavior. And this work itself shows behavioral plasticity or that kind of, that an individual can change in response to the environment. But plasticity itself might be an evolutionary advantage because uh, urban spaces are constantly changing. And then I love this study of lizards in Puerto Rico. This is one of the studies that I got to work on. So lizards in Puerto Rico have longer legs and stickier feet that allow them to move more easily on urban substrates. And you can imagine that we're using all these weird things to build buildings like concrete, metal, glass. We're painting these surfaces. And those are harder to stick to if you're a lizard than running up a tree. And so Kristen, Dr. Winchell's work showed that these lizards actually have more lamellae on their fingertips to allow them to grasp onto those, those surfaces, like here you see a painted dumpster that this lizard is on. They also have longer limbs, and this is because trees are less evenly spaced and further apart in urban areas versus the lizard's natural environment or um, non-urban environment where it's living in this forest. And you can imagine me versus LeBron James running across a basketball court, and in the same amount of steps, he's gonna make it to the other side a lot faster. And that's because he's a lot taller, his limbs have a lot more <laughs> coverage. And that's basically what these lizards are doing. They're LeBron Jaming them. <laughs> They've evolved to this. They, they can now um, run faster because they have these longer limbs. And so this is a really cool study on adaptation. But I wanted to kind of show you that uh, urbanization or uh, urbanization influences the population genetic structure, the behavior and adaptation, all of which can be evolutionary processes. And so much of my research focuses on, on how these wildlife are responding and how universal the patterns we're seeing. How, what, what is the likelihood that we're going to see this pattern again? And so when I got to my PhD, a lot of, I was a mammologist 
but the mammals were all being worked on. A lot of the, the good animals, the coyotes, the rats, the, the mice that we have in New York City were all being worked on. So I was like, I'll choose pigeons. Pigeons are going to be so great because they're going to be so easy to catch. Like this, I'm going to fly through my PhD in like four years. It's going to be so easy. I was very naive. So I know everybody in here has seen a pigeon. Uh, I know you all have experiences with pigeons, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background on them. So they're native to Asia and North Africa and Southern Europe, where they live on rocky cliffs and eat grains. And you can imagine that our tall city buildings really mimic that. They were originally domesticated by humans around five to 10,000 years ago. Uh, originally as a food source, we still eat pigeon. We call it squab. It's actually very delicious. It's kind of like beef. It's very, very hearty. Uh, but eventually we domesticated other birds and there's a lot more meat on a chicken than on a pigeon. And so we began to breed these pigeons for their racing ability. So their ability to navigate home really, really quickly and also as show traits. Just like we have show dogs and, and dog shows and we actually have cat shows as well, we have pigeon shows. This is a thing that people like to do. So they breed in these crazy, crazy traits, like these curly, curly feathers. Um, they'll breed in a big hood or a big fan tail or feathered feet. And the, you can then go and have your pigeon judged and win money based on how beautiful your pigeon is. And so we continue to see some of these traits in the feral population because people either intentionally or unintentionally release them. Pigeons are known for their long distance flight and their homing ability, so they're really good at finding their way home. I am not so good at that. If you put me on a plane and drop me in the middle of nowhere, I would have no idea which way to go to get back to California right now. But these pigeons can do that. If I had brought a pigeon with me that I had raised in California, it would be able to fly back to California. And so uh, you might remember in wars and things like that, that pigeons become these little heroes um, transporting messages. They're really this cool organism that has, has evolved alongside and, and with humans, and we've really taken advantage of their natural um, abilities. Pigeons also have incredibly rapid reproduction and fast population turnover. Their offspring are also really weird looking. So you've probably never seen a baby pigeon and that is because pigeons will stay in their nest being um, fed and tended for by both parents until they're, pra they're practically full grown. But this is what a baby pigeon looks like. They typically have a clutch size of two. Um, and they're cared for by both, both parents, both the mother and the father will continue to, to feed. Um, there, when I got to my PhD, it was kind of cool. There wasn't a lot of research going on on pigeon population genetics. People were interested in pigeon like intelligence and their homing abilities and their ability to identify cancer cells, stuff like that. But not a lot of stuff going on, research going on on urban evolution and how these pigeons are evolving in urban spaces. So we know that genetic distance increases with geographic distance. Inbreeding may be really common within flocks. And they put these backpacks on these pigeons and tracked them from their home roost and found that they're going about 590 meters. So less than a kilometer from their home roost. Your pigeon neighbors are your neighbors. That's their home. They're not commuting that much. And so if you see a pigeon, like you can be like, oh yeah, I've seen you before, buddy. And I actually noticed this throughout my dissertation research that I would see the same individuals in the same location. So they're not moving far. And we also know from previous research that pigeons form a single genetic cluster or one population on the island of Singapore. And it's, Singapore is a heavily urbanized island nation. So it's unclear kind of what's going on, what is causing this history. Is it because Singapore is so urbanized? Is it because pigeons don't like to cross water and Singapore is an island, so they're not leaving much? It could also be because pigeons were introduced into Singapore in the 1960s, and there hasn't just been enough time for population differentiation to occur. So one of my chapters in my dissertation focused on how do gene flow and genetic drift structure the feral population uh, pigeon population in the northeastern megacity. So these are non-adaptive evolutionary processes that occur and um, lead to population differentiation. And 
I wanted to originally focus on New York and my advisor said I needed to expand and that really scared me, but I was able to do it. Um, the Northeastern megacity is a giant, giant megacity. It covers less than 2% of the nation's land area, but contains 17% of the population, 52 million people live within this corridor from Boston down to Washington, DC. Um, it is the most heavily urbanized area in the United States. As you can see here, uh, if you're colorblind, maybe not. But uh, in red here, we have all the impervious surface, so where you're not getting a lot of trees, a lot of um, natural forest areas, grasslands. And you can see here that each city kind of looks like its own island, right? Like this is maybe an archipelago chain. And so that, that had led me to think about some things and kind of form some of my hypotheses. And most urban evolution studies up until my research have really focused on a single city or comparing a couple different cities that were nearby. But animals don't care about political boundaries. Wildlife doesn't care about political boundaries. And so our city definitions might not mean the same thing to wildlife. And just to kind of show you how urbanized this area is, I want you to look at this area at night. This is so bright. There's so much connectivity among these different cities. And you can see that like when I'm driving up and down from Boston to DC, it's just suburb after suburb after suburb, except for this little patch up in Connecticut uh, between New York and Providence. I don't know if you can see. Right, right about here. So this kind of led me to some different uh, hypotheses about how my, my pigeon population might be structured. And one thing that we might have is panmixia, maybe across all of the Northeast, is just one giant pigeon population. And everybody's kind of breeding with everybody else. We might have isolation by distance, where from Boston down to DC, we get, start to see some population differentiation because while they are moving a little bit, they're really like Boston pigeons are not breeding with DC pigeons. And we might have isolation by barrier. So normally when we think of isolation by barrier, we think of something like a road preventing a turtle or a salamander from being able to cross that road. But I want you to think about pigeons and think about if you've ever seen a pigeon in a forest. And so I had to kind of flip my thinking because this was such an urban animal that we don't see pigeons in forests. We don't see pigeons in areas that aren't heavily urbanized. Um, maybe if there's a grain silo nearby, they'll be in those areas. But in general, these, these forests tend to act, could potentially act as a barrier. So these were kind of some of the hypotheses that I had going in. And I ended up sampling almost 500 individuals. It was exhausting. I drove all up and down the East Coast for years. I thought it, like I said, I thought it was going to be easy to catch them. It was not. Um, and it was also very hard to find pigeons in some of these areas, places like Providence, where I was only able to get a couple individuals. Um, and that was not for lack of effort. That was, they... They just weren't there. Uh, so sampled all across the Northeast in each of these cities, kind of focusing on this idea that, you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, each city is going to be a completely different population, especially if they're only moving 590 meters on a, on a daily basis. How I collected my data uh, was very interesting. I thought I had a bunch of different ideas, like I could just put a pigeon trap on my car and the pigeon trap pigeons would just come in and that didn't work. And then I put a pigeon trap on my roof and it took them two weeks to get accustomed to going into the pigeon trap and that was not gonna work. And so I ended up finding this thing online called a net gun. And this is how it works. So I would spread seed out on the ground and the pigeons would come and <laughs> feed on the seed. And then I would shoot them with this net and it would capture them. And you can see a ton of the pigeons get away, but we still caught, I think, 10 in that net, which was a great sample size. We sampled all those individuals. Uh, once they're in the net, they're very, very calm. And this always looked really crazy on 
city streets, people are just like, what are you doing? This is the most wild thing I've ever seen. Uh, and that's why I'm wearing the safety vest as well. Uh, so once I had the pigeons in hand, they each went into like a paper Whole Foods bag. And that was because it was a nice dark area that was calm for them. And this has allowed me to process each one individually. I collected blood from each individual. And just in the same way that when you go and get your blood drawn uh, by a phlebotomist, exactly the same. Just really easy to take a little bit of blood from these pigeons. And then I did something called DDRAD sequencing. And DDRAD is reduced representation genome sequencing, where we use enzymes to chop up the DNA and get basically thousands of small regions um, in which we can look at relatedness. And this is a great technique. It's kind of going by the wayside now where we're able to do whole genomes, but a couple of years ago, this was, it was really easy. We ended up collecting 35,000 SNPs that we could use um, to compare across the one gigabase genome from pigeons. Just if you like numbers. Uh, we used bow tie to align sequences to the pigeon genome. Thankfully, we had a whole pigeon genome and used stacks to identify SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms and went into our analysis. So what did we find? Uh, we found that uh, pigeons in the Northeast, looking at this, this is an admixture plot. So each individual line up there is an individual pigeon and at K equals two, which is our most well-supported hypothesis of two populations, we're seeing the different proportion of ancestry in different colors. If you're not familiar with these, that's okay. I'm going to walk you through them. Basically, you can see the pigeons from, come on, from New York down to Washington, D.C. are basically all the same color, right? So they're all one population. And then we have these weird pigeons up here, Providence and Boston, that are acting, looking like some kind of other population. That was weird. So uh, did I trust this? Not really. So I went on to do a discriminant analysis of principal components. Again, that's a big fancy word, but basically what I want you to look at here is first across the x-axis. So looking across the x-axis only, I see that Providence and Boston are again pulling out as a separate population. And then looking along the y-axis, I see a little bit more differentiation. New York and Philadelphia are kind of pulling apart as a separate population and Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Now this kind of confirms what I was seeing in my admixture and kind of gives us this idea of maybe there is something going on. Maybe these Boston Providence pigeons are different from these southern pigeons. And so this kind of leads me to think, what is going on here? And maybe, maybe that, um, whew, there we go, maybe that area of Connecticut right there that's a little bit more suburban, I know it's more forested, um, is acting as this barrier for pigeons. So this isolation by barrier idea. Again, flipping on its head when you're thinking about urban animals, normally you think about roads being a barrier and the idea that a forest is a barrier is kind of this, I don't know, it, it surprised me. So all, this, all of this to say, anthropogenic and life history processes are really influencing pigeon population genetics. They can fly and they will fly in between these cities. They're probably not moving that much. We found that within the city, they were mostly related to each other. Uh, but that, that this way that we're structuring our cities is definitely having some influence on this, this population. Another study that I did that I absolutely love because I know every single person in this room has done this study at some point in their life was flight initiation distance. So flight initiation distance is how close can you get to a pigeon before it flies away? Everybody's done that? Yeah. <laughs> so we looked at this. I had a student come to me and was interested in this and he went all over New York City, the five boroughs, to quantify if there were differences within the city. And this came from this idea that people kept coming up to me and being like, I can like kick a pigeon in Times Square. Like I'm stumbling over these pigeons in Times Square. And what's up with that? And I was like, yeah, but you can't like, in some of the outer boroughs, like you can't get as close and it's been really hard to catch those pigeons. So 
what, what's going on there? Um, and this was done by a, an undergraduate student, Richard Lee, um, who's now a graduate student at Yale. And he looked at this relationship between flight initiation distance and landscape features. And then Kristen Winchell, Dr. Kristen Winchell, who had done the lizard study, who's one of my friends, was like, you, you can't just look at landscape. You have to think about predators because pigeons have predators in the city as well. Mm. So mad at her about that. I was like, I do have to look at predators. So we ended up looking at predators and kind of uh, figuring out some unique ways to look at them. But this FID, this flight initiation distance behavior, represents this trade-off between avoidance of threats, right? I'm the threat walking towards this bird, and this bird being able to continue a behavior that it may increase its fitness, right? Like foraging or mating or parental care. And we would predict, these are fancy words, we would predict that flight initiation distance should decrease as perceived threats decrease. So as I am perceived as less of a threat, I should be able to get closer to the pigeon. I feel like that's a very fancy way of saying you can get closer to a pigeon if it's not as scared of you. But we like the scientific terms. Uh, so this is how we did it. He literally just walked towards pigeons and measured how close it was before it either walked or flew away. Um, and he would approximate the distance he was from the pigeon when he walked towards it and then walk towards it and then measure the distance he was when the pigeon uh, moved away. And he repeated this experiment over 500 times all over the city. And we looked at a bunch of different variables. And the reason that he repeated it all over the city was because I think people have this idea, this misconception, that New York City only looks like Times Square. And it really doesn't. So there are these like completely forested, there we go. I'm not good at this yet. These completely forested areas in Prospect Park. You have these like industrial canals in Gowanus. These are fields up here in Central Park that are completely open. You do have Times Square that's incredibly, incredibly um, urbanized, all concrete, not a single plant, lots of people all the time. And then things like cemeteries and suburbs down here. So New York is incredibly heterogeneous in, in terms of its landscape. And we thought that there might be something there that these landscape variables might be influencing. And not only did we look at landscape, we also looked at pedestrians um, and population size because nobody lives in Times Square. Honestly, nobody has their address as like one Times Square. That is, would be miserable. All New Yorkers tend to avoid Times Square as much as they can. But it's a big tourist destination. There's tons of pedestrians. And so that's going to have potentially some influence on how close you can get. So as you might expect, you can get closer to a pigeon where more people live. I think we all kind of could have made that prediction. You can get closer to pigeons in areas with more pedestrians. And you can get closer to pigeons in areas with more impervious surface, more roads, and less canopy cover. So all of this made sense, right? That, that's all kind of what we would expect. And this is why Kristen said we had to look at predators. Yeah, I was so mad at her. Uh, so we also, we, and we noticed that these, these predators would come and disrupt our research. As we were walking towards an animal, we would get hawk blocked, where a hawk would come in and <laughs> and disturb our, our pigeon flock. And so we couldn't get a good measurement. And while we counted these, uh, we knew that this was occurring lots of times when we weren't seeing it as well. So where those predators were, those hawks were coming in and, and hawk blocking our investigation, but also um, having some kind of influence on the pigeon population. We chose to look at three um, three raptors, and this is because there was evidence of these three raptors eating pigeons. I could go through their diets and have, find evidence of them having pigeons in their diet. But it was really hard to get raptor occurrences. New York City didn't want to release that data to me. They have a, da they have a database where all these raptor nests are, but they did not want to release that to me. I, I worked with them as much as I could. Uh, they also wouldn't release the feral cat populations to me. Uh, so we know where the feral cats are, they wouldn't release it. So we ended up turning to community science data, which is one of which is eBird, where people make a list of all the birds that they've seen. 
And this was just to give us an approximation of where these were, birds were more or less often. And what we found was that Cooper's hawks had no sightings. Um, Cooper hawk sightings had no influence on flight initiation distance. Flight initiation distance increased as red-tailed hawk sightings increased, but decreased as peregrine falcon sightings increased. So that was really weird, and we're like scratching our heads. I'm not an ornithologist, I'm a mammalogist, like what is going on here? And I started talking to friends, and they're like, well, those two birds feed really differently. So I'm gonna show you a video of peregrine falcon catching a pigeon. And it's gonna catch this pigeon in the air. It's gonna swoop down and grab that pigeon. Peregrine falcons are known as sky Lamborghinis, and so they can go incredibly fast, and they will just swoop down out there and catch those pigeons. Meanwhile, these red-tailed hawks have a different hunting method. They will come down on the ground and grab a pigeon that's just on the ground. And red-tailed hawks are also, here's another video, they're very much in urban areas, they're comfortable around people, and so here's one getting on a New York balcony grabbing that, uh, that pigeon. And uh, so what we think is going on here is that pigeons are responding differently because they know that different predators are around. So if there's potentially some something going on where I'm going to remove myself from the situation and get out of here, if a predator is coming, if there's lots of uh, red-tailed hawks around. But if there's lots of peregrine falcons, you know, maybe I'll just hang out here. It's not that big of a threat. So they're doing some kind of mental math and calculations. I have some ideas about how we can further expand this. It involves mannequins, which I don't want to fill my house with, but I have this idea that we get like store mannequins and put them out and see if pigeon, or peregrine falcons are coming down to grab the pigeons uh, or if red tail hawks are coming down. So all of this to say that anthropogenic, again, and life history processes are influencing pigeon behavior in New York City. Of course, this is all pigeons, and I love pigeons now. I'm a total convert. But my true heart lies in neology, and I also really wanted to understand how universal are these concepts. And so I needed to expand the cities that I was working in and the type of organism that I was working on. And that led me to the eastern gray squirrel, which is very abundant throughout Missouri. And um, I wanted to look at these things like population genetic structure, behavior, and adaptation. A little bit about the eastern gray squirrel. I think you all have the fox squirrel here from what I was seeing. Um, but the eastern gray squirrel is native to North America. It comes in multiple color morphs. One of the really exciting things about this squirrel um, people get very excited about seeing the black squirrels during the squirrel census, and uh, they also come in gray form. They typically nest in trees, but you can see here it's really using that anthropogenic surface. It's nesting in like a car front area, um, and they are incredibly common in urban parks and suburbs. You can see them feeding on the trash can there. So of course, I flew or I can fly, I actually drove from New York to Missouri during the middle of the pandemic to start my postdoc. And it meant that I hadn't been there to like survey my study site, despite the fact that I had put in this NSF proposal to study squirrels in Missouri. Um, and this became a problem. Where am I gonna find these squirrels? And so normally when you get to an area and you're, you're trying to find your animals, there are a bunch of different things that you can use. You can put out camera traps, you can do field surveys, you can look at environmental DNA, and all of those were going to be costly and time consuming. And so I turned to like community science, these platforms like eBird and iNaturalist, to look at how things were, wh where should I go and invest my time in studying these squirrels? And what I found was that eastern gray squirrel observations were tended to be towards the southern part of St. Louis. This little blob looking thing, that's St. Louis. Kind of looks like a stomach or kidney, I don't know. Um, and okay, that was kind of weird to me. 
especially when you look at canopy cover, which seems pretty even across the city. And so what was going on there? Were there really no squirrels in the northern part of the city, or was there just something else going on? Um, and when you look at a human population, it's not like there's less people there, so less people are observing those things. So I actually tweeted this out. I was, I was kind of confused about what was going on, and I tweeted this out. And I put out this tweet that says, wondering about community uh, bias in community science data, here's an example from St. Louis. On the left is a racial dot map. So a racial dot map, there's one dot for every 10 people. And on the right are iNaturalist observations of squirrels. Squirrel observations are abundant in the north, uh, squirrels are abundant in the northern part of the city, but there are no reported observations. That is because St. Louis is so segregated that people are not moving between these areas and the people using these community science platforms are, are biasing these data. And that became a real concern of mine. Uh, and thinking just to kind of give you some history on St. Louis, it is a Southern state. Um, the, uh, the wealth disparity is massive. You can see up here on the top is North St. Louis where we have lots of vacant houses. And below that is a house, this giant mansion that's right down the street from me. Um, and there is just a, like row upon row of mansions. And these areas are, um, are very close together. They're a couple kilometers. Um, a little bit more about St. Louis. It sits near the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. It has a population of about 300,000, but about 3 million in the metro area. And just to give you some ideas, the medium home value in the southern part, the white part of the city, is $310,000, income about $50,000, and population of the bachelor's degree, 67. In the census block, right next to that, the medium home value is $78,000, median income is 22, and population with a bachelor's degree is five. This is an incredibly segregated city. And so we started, uh, after this tweet, a bunch of colleagues kind of came to me. We started to think about what does this mean for these community science data sets and how should we be using them? And so we have this idea of the actual species pool that is occurring uh, out there in the wild in urban areas. Maybe it's different across the, the urban parks versus the suburbs for good versus the super industrialized area. And people tend to only use these community science platforms in parks or in very kind of urban um, green spaces. So we're, we're already subsetting that individual. And then what people are choosing, um, who's, who's participating in these community science platforms, they tend to be older white people who know about the app and have the time to use them. I'm not gonna go out and take a picture of every little wildlife thing if I am rushing into my class or I am rushing to a doctor's appointment. And then obviously we're going to lose some animals because of a detectability filter. It's a lot harder to see things that are in the water, things that are nocturnal, and so we're going to not tend to pick up those as frequently as possible. We have a huge sampling bias um, where people are more likely to participate in sampling our wildlife, our urban wildlife in green spaces than in gray spaces. So you can imagine being in like downtown Salt Lake and you're not going to stop and take a picture of a pigeon and add that to the database. But if you're in a park and you see a cute squirrel or you see a really cool looking bird, maybe you're going to add that. We have a preference filter where we tend to prefer to add things that are, um, or tend to not add things that are pests or boring or uncharismatic. I don't know anybody who's like adding rats to in New York City to the public database. Um, people think of rats as pests. People think of rats as uninteresting to study and not part of the quote natural community. And so why should we have to include these? It's a huge problem in museums as well. And this really means that we have this reported species pool in these community science apps that are way less than what we're actually seeing out there. And this was um, 
kind of what I was getting at and what I found when I started to go sample St. Louis. So it, it became this idea, and this is a, a theory paper that we have, um, that social biases filter the species pool into these reported sightings that favor species with our societal values. We're gonna report things that we value and in areas that we value, and they're going to be reported by people who have the time to work on these allegations. So we need to be very careful, and I learned this lesson myself, um, we need to be very, very careful when we're thinking about these community science apps within our own usage and figuring out where to sample. Just so you know, my observations all over, uh, all over St. Louis. I was able to collect squirrels everywhere. Um, it, they're not biased towards the south. They're, they're definitely there in the northern part of the city. Um, it was just not being picked up on these apps. So, where are we doing on time? Okay. So obviously, um, I got I wanted to come to St. Louis to study these squirrels, and once I figured out where they were, I was really interested in how the ecology of the uh, St. Louis and influenced evolution in this cycle. So we know across St. Louis that there are differences in garbage pickup and even the age of the dumpster. So this is a dumpster in North City. And why I know that is because do you see all those holes? Those holes were gnawed in by squirrels so they could access that dumpster. Dumpsters are a great place to catch squirrels. It's just fantastic. Um, and there's differences in housing across the northern part of the city and where the vacant housing is. We know that there's differences in lead levels and the soil and probably arsenic and those types of things as well and differences in road speed and road access. So we actually have private neighborhoods within the city of St. Louis. So neighborhoods that even though I am a taxpayer within the city, I cannot access, I cannot walk in these neighborhoods, I cannot drive my car in these neighborhoods. And while that might provide a refugia for wildlife within that neighborhood, it makes it very difficult for them to disperse. So, um, that was kind of what I was interested in in shaping my research. We're still getting some of the data back. I have it downloaded on a, on a big hard drive right now, and I'm getting ready to analyze it. Um, my students, I want to give a huge shout out. This was all done. This work was done by my students and my dog. My dog is very important to that, dropping in rural areas. Um, he came with me most of the time. So this research was done by students, allowing them to get hands-on um, experience, kind of sampling the animals, placing the traps, putting the animals under anesthesia. And then just to kind of prove, there's actually a trap hidden in that garbage pile with the Grinch. Uh, we definitely caught a squirrel in that one too. I was very proud of that trap placement. Uh, so yeah, there's these, these squirrels are, are coming and foraging in these dumpsters. Uh, and so one of the things that I was really interested in was diet. And that's in part because when I was in grad school, I saw this video of the Shake Shack squirrel. And that squirrel knows what it wants from that Shake Shack. Uh, this is in Madison Square Park where the original Shake Shack is. And it's gonna get this lid off and then drink that chocolate milkshake. And so I was really interested <laughs> in, in how diet might differ across these different urban spaces and across urban to rural. And then we also talked about Kristen Winchell's work and you know LeBron James and the, the lizards and having these longer limbs. And I was like, well, the trees are much further spaced apart in these urban areas. So maybe something's going on with their morphometrics, their limbs, or their skulls, because both of those are very related to diet. So I have two undergrads working on that right now, Caitlin and Jenny. And this is what Caitlin has found. She found that as an impervious surface, as like urbanization increases, weight increases. Kind of makes sense. So the urban squirrels are heavier. I don't want to say fatter, they're heavier. Um, and yeah, that was done by Caitlin. She also found that squirrel skulls are getting longer, taller, and skinnier. And so longer this way, taller this way and skinnier in their width um, in urban environments. And that this is not linked to weight, meaning that it's not just that larger squirrels have longer heads um, and taller heads. It's unrelated to that, 
but that we're getting some kind of difference going on with potential morphometrics happening with these school schools. Um, again, done by Caitlin. Jenny decided to look at diet and we're using stable isotopes or this great uh, way to kind of relatively look at diet. And I'm not gonna go through all of this, but basically with carbon, we can tell how much grain, or how much corn something is eating. And with nitrogen, we can tell if it's eating more meat. You can see, Jenny took this picture of this pizza swirl outside of her dorm. Uh, that, a swirl eating pizza. So she found that as impervious surface or urbanization increases, we saw this big signature of nitrogen 15, meaning that the squirrels in more urban areas are eating more meat. You might think of squirrels as like vegetarian or granivores. Absolutely not. They are chomping down on that meat. And here's some social media just to show you. These squirrels are eating chicken and egg rolls and pizza. And so they are absolutely chomping down on that meat. I've had to pull a squirrel off of another roadkill squirrel. Uh, social media is great. Uh, but then uh, she looked at carbon and she didn't see a difference. I and mean, we would think in more urban areas, these, these people are eating more sugary foods or corn syrup enriched foods. And so why are we not seeing as urbanization increases this change in carbon? And I'm that really, I like struggle, and I think back to this quote of Jedi Darwin, but I am very poorly today, and very stupid, and I hate everybody and everything, and one lives only to make wonders. <laughs> and I was just struggling with this idea. This is something that we come across, you know, I came across this with the predators, with the birds. I'm just so frustrated. I don't understand what is going on here. And then I was driving around one day, literally just driving around, looking, probably picking up roadkill, and realized that life is going to find a way. And that is because squirrels are going to access these bird feeders. And all throughout the suburbs, it's very likely that these squirrels, you can see in this video here, it's about to jump. Look at that jump. It is going to get that bird seed. And so, uh, we see this all over. I started searching social media and found all these instances of these supposed uh, squirrel poop bird feeders being accessed. This person tried to put a slinky on it so the squirrel couldn't climb up. Um, later on in that video, you see the squirrel successfully navigate the slinky to get the bird seed. So uh, I want you to think of these as wildlife feeders in our backyard and not as bird feeders. And, and really appreciate this wildlife, this wonderful, wonderful wildlife that we do get to access and view in our cities. And I know that squirrels can sometimes be considered pests or pain. I know that pigeons can. But it's also really cool that we get to interact with these animals and see these animals sharing this space with us. So with that, I want to say happy birthday to my favorite Jedi Master. <laughs> um, that I am so honored and thankful that y'all invited me here. AI image generators can create some really cool things when you type in Darwin Jedi. Um, and thank you all uh, for, for inviting me and to my funding sources, and thank you for listening. I would love to take questions prioritizing students and early career researchers. Thank you. <laughs> Student questions. Yeah, so that study was actually done by my lab mate, Dr. Matthew Combs, and it's not two different species. I think that's a common misconception. It's two different populations. There's just some kind of barrier happening. It's not, it's unlikely that this will lead to speciation, um, likely because we're, we're still moving these rats back and forth. Uh, so it's more just that there's some kind of barrier. He thinks that it's uh, it's likely due to Midtown and there being less restaurants and less food resources occurring in those areas. Um, so yeah, that I worked on that study, um, had to deal with 
some pretty gross rats in the lab. They do not, I, I'm gonna take pigeons any day over rats now. Um, but yeah, that, so we, we think that there's just some population structuring in the same way that there's population structuring between Asians and Europeans and Africans um, and South Americans, that it's all the same species. There's just some slight differentiations there. When you're trying to sample like animals in the wild, what sort of variables can you control for? Like how fast you walk up to a pigeon or like what sort of Yeah, so the question was about variables and how you can control variables in urban environments. And it it depends. We tested Richard and made sure that he kept a constant pace. And so that was like the first couple days of testing was just to make sure that he could walk at a consistent pace. Um, so there are things like that that you can control. There are a lot of things that you can't control. Uh, people coming up to you and asking you what the heck you're doing? Why are you here? Why are you catching these pigeons? Um, oftentimes I would think that I could get to, you know, X number of field sites in a day. And then I'd get caught talking to someone for an hour or two hours and just kind of, give up and you're like, this is part of what I do as a researcher. They're very excited. Um, so there's those kinds of things. I have a lot of privilege as a white woman going into these areas because I people are not gonna question my presence there. They're just gonna kind of be like, why is this crazy woman catching pigeons? I've never had a police encounter where they've asked me to stop doing what I'm doing. And I know that is that is because of my race, and I'm very, very conscious of that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Do you have any tips for like observing urban animals? Do I have any tips for observing urban animals? Go to neighborhoods where people are, I mean, in St. Louis, people are like, don't go to that neighborhood, it's not safe. Like, it is, I felt very safe in those neighborhoods. And those are some of the most uh, underrepresented neighborhoods in terms of this biodiversity sampling. And so going to those neighborhoods, if there's cemeteries in those neighborhoods, you can look at maps and see what areas are missing these kinds of observations. So going and contributing to those. And our biggest concern is that policymakers are going to look at this. And there's a lot of what we call gray literature, right? Where people are making these policy decisions, but it's hard for us to find because it's not in the academic literature. People are making policy decisions about where we should invest in our parks. And based on the iNaturalist data, you would think, hey, let's go invest in parks and biodiversity in the southern, more white part of St. Louis. And that's actually this misrepresentation of what's actually going on there. Go ahead. What about like I want to watch pigeons. Oh, if you Once want. I decided where I'm doing it. Okay. What, what tips do you have for finding that? What tips do I have uh, for finding them? Okay. For finding pigeons, I would look at a map on my phone, and then I would go to the Home Depot, and they were traditionally in the parking lots of the Home Depot or the dollar store. That tends to be where they were. Um, I found them a lot less frequently in parks than people kind of imagine. Every time I would talk to a neighborhood, someone in a the neighborhood, they'd be like, oh, just go to the park. No, that's not a thing. They're not there, I try. Um, asking people, like I spent a lot of time going to Starbucks and Target and uh, asking people where they saw big flocks of pigeons and then going there to observe and try to catch those pigeons. So people are this great wealth of information and then it's kind of random. I one time was in a Costco parking lot and saw someone dump out an entire thing of oatmeal for the pigeons. And I was like, great, I'm going to catch those pigeons as soon as you leave. So <laughs> lots of, it just kind of depends. Um, a lot of people are feeding pigeons. Um, so you found a lot of uh, biased data in terms of race when going through the community science um, data. How did you go about realizing that it had to do with race specifically? Yeah, so one of the things that I was aware of when I moved to St. Louis, because it was brought to my attention almost nonstop, was people telling me not to go to the northern part of the city. Don't go there, it's not safe. It's not safe, you're going to get shot, don't go there. Every single person I talked to when I was told them that I was new in St. Louis told me that. And 
you know, I of course have been doing my due diligence before moving to St. Louis and learning about the city and learning about the history of segregation in this city. And so it became kind of just very apparent to me that people were telling me not to go as a white person, not to go sample in these black neighborhoods. And so I just like, I started looking at these racial dot maps. I started pulling up these racial dot maps, looking at where people were living. And it became very evident that there was this pattern of undersampling in black neighborhoods um, for, for a whole plethora of reasons we think it is. We think it's due to time poverty, that people don't have time, people don't know about the applications, people don't um, care, like what, what is the point of investing in these, these biodiversity data. And so I think just broadly we need to be very careful about how we're using these. And that's okay, there's still great data out there. Absolutely you should be contributing to these, these community science platforms but be aware that there is some bias in there and where you might be contributing bias and how you can overcome that. You mentioned a lack of cooperation from the New York, I believe it was the city government or in finding your data. Was there a reason they cited for that? Uh, I have gotten everything from scientists are not trustworthy. <laughs> uh, you just want to go and harm our feral cat populations. You're going to try to take advantage of our, um, our parent falcons. Lots of things in New York are very, very political. It's a huge city. Uh, there are lots of reasons and just a lot of bureaucracy. On the plus side, there's also a ton of data. We have a one foot by one foot impervious surface map. We know where every tree is in New York City. Uh, we have pedestrian data. We know where more people walk. So there are there are good things and bad things. And just within my my six years or you know the the five years of collecting data, I was just never able to convince anybody within the government that they should give me this data set. Um, that happens very frequently. And then you feel poorly and you hate everyone and everything. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Okay, I think we are about to head outside for birthday cake. Yes. And thank you all so much. I'll be around if you still have questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, let's go outside and then have some birthday cake. Yeah, we got the button yet. Go outside and get your buttons too. <laughs>